Amen. Let's just open in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. We praise you for this day. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is always anointed. And thank you, Lord, that you have called us to come and hear your word today. Now, Father, I pray that I will speak what's on your heart today. And Lord, what you would want us to hear and what you want us to do. Because, Lord, we know that you love us and you care about us. And we know, Lord, that you have the best intention for each and every one of us. And so we give you the praise and we give you the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning I want to talk to you about keeping your eye on the prize. What I find is many Christians today, and you know it's part of the biblical plan that many will fall away from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, doctrines of devils. We understand that we're in the last days, and if you don't think so, you need to read your Bible. We're living in the last days, and the last days are telling us that many are falling away from the faith. And in Jude it says that we're to earnestly contend for the faith. That word contend is a military term, and it means to fight. It means to take a stand against. We're earnestly to stand and contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. And today we see so much compromise, we see so much taking place in the Christian church today. And many times we see Christians falling by the wayside. We see them going back into the world. But I remember what our sister Deb used to say to me. She said, there's nowhere I can go in the world. There's nowhere to go back. What can I go back to? If, I, if that was ever to happen, wh why would I want to go back into the world? There's nothing there for me. And that's true. There's nothing in, in, the, in the world that is more advantageous to you and I than to be with the Lord Jesus Christ and have eternal life. Amen? Amen. Praise God. If you have your Bibles, open them up, please, to the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians. The Apostle Paul here is writing this prison epistle. And I appreciate so much our brother praying this morning, Nelson, over the offering and praying for the Christians that are in these countries that are being killed. And there are 11 Christians every single day being killed for their faith. There are 11, if you were to average it out, every single day, 365 days a year. So even as we're speaking now, somewhere in the world, one of your brothers, one of your sisters are being martyred for their faith. And yet you and I come to church and we're free to come and free to be a part of, of what God's doing and Yet, that threat is not upon us yet. And I say that, yet. Our rights are slowly being taken away. And uh, it's going to come upon us suddenly if we don't make a stand and say something. For, uh, Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to start with verse 12 this, this morning. I had another message I was going to preach, but uh, I felt the Lord wanted me to go in this direction. First, let me uh, preclude this to say that the Apostle Paul was writing this letter to the Philippians while he was in prison for his faith. He was waiting to be transported to Rome. And once he got to Rome, you know, the end result was going to be that he was going to be a martyr. The Apostle Paul ended up dying a martyr's death by having his head cut off for his faith. And it so amazes me when I look and I see how he was such an in opposition to Christianity. He fought against Christianity. He even put some Christians to death. He was even agreeing to the stoning of Stephen when there was a man named Saul that was holding the coats of those who were stoning. He threw many Christians into prison. 
And he brought many before the council to stand trial because he believed he was doing God a service. So when I see that and people that are skeptic about Christianity, I say, you have to tell me how this man who was so in opposition to Christianity, all of a sudden something happened to change his direction, to change the very thinking of years and years and years of training and thought of his religion. And so, we now have the Apostle Paul here, speaking to the Philippian church from prison. And when I say prison, please understand, it's not like today they have cable television, exercise rooms, they can go to school and get their degrees. I'm not talking about those kind of prisons. I'm talking about a cave. When it rains, the cave leaks and there's water. There's no running sewage. There's no plumbing. See, we're thinking, when we think of prison, that's what we think of because we're living in today and we see the prisons today. But there was no running water. There was no plumbing. So when they had to go to the bathroom, they went in the cave with bars on it. These caves were so low that you couldn't stand up straight in them. You had, to, you had to walk like this. So I want you to understand that he was there for years. But it was in that condition. And he didn't let that stop him from doing what God wanted him to do. He didn't let the circumstances of his life take control over his life and stop doing what God wanted him to do. Because there was a key to his walk with God. There was a key to his um, serving God. And we're going to see what that key is this morning. In verse 12, he's talking to the Philippian church and he says, not as though I had already attained. And he's talking about perfection. Many times we see preachers and we think they're perfect and we're not. We have things that God is dealing with us just like God is dealing with you. But I believe also on a higher level of accountability and responsibility. He says, not that I have already attained. Either we're already perfect. But I follow after. There was something the Apostle Paul was fixed on. There was something that the Apostle Paul had his whole heart angle toward. If that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. He was following that. What is that? He was following something. The Apostle Paul was following after the teaching of Christ that taught him that it was no longer him that lived, but Christ lived in him. He said in Galatians, I believe, it is no longer I that liveth, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in this flesh... I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And by living that crucified life, and as I was thinking on a, another message yesterday, I thought that how true it is that, in fact, I, I messaged somebody on Facebook they couldn't understand why some Christians are doing what they're doing. And I said, because they're living a crossless Christianity. There is no such thing as biblical crossless Christianity. It's not just grace that you're saved. 
It's you are crucified with Christ. It's that you come into that relationship, that covenant agreement with him. That it's no longer you that's going to live. For the Bible says you have been bought with the price of the precious blood of Jesus. Therefore glorify God in your body. Your life is not your own anymore. You don't have say anymore. If you're a biblical Christian. Now there's nominal Christianity. There's denominational Christianity. There's affiliation Christianity. That you can affiliate with a church and be called a Christian. You can be a part of a denomination and be a Christian. But you cannot be a biblical Christian without the cross of Jesus Christ working, in, in, working effectively in your life. And here Paul is saying, I haven't attained yet, but I, I'm not perfect, but I'm following after perfection. How can you and I follow after perfection? It's by dying to self. Because the more you die to self, the more that he can live. And the more that he can live, the more that he can come and change your life. And the more you change your life, you're moving on toward perfection. Verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. In other words, what he's saying is, it's, I haven't got the whole thing. It's not all a part of me yet. No, we're talking about the Apostle Paul. And how many of you and I can say we have not apprehended yet either? He said, but this one thing I do. There is one thing that I do. Out of the many things that can be counted or the many things that could be said, he says, there's one thing that I do. I find this portion of scripture so essential to Christian growth. So essential from abstaining from stagnation. This portion of scripture to keep you from backsliding. From allowing the circumstances of life and the things of life to weigh you down and to keep you down. The Apostle Paul says, this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind. And that's your past. So many Christians live in their past. Even when it comes to experience with God. Oh, Joe, I remember the old days when the Spirit of God moved way back then. Oh, I remember this and that. Oh, way back then. Then the question is, if God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, who moved? God still wants to do the same things that he did yesterday. Hallelujah. So it's you and I. What happens is we get our eyes out of focus. We begin to focus on the here and now. We begin to focus on our problems. We begin to focus on our situation. We begin to focus on things of this world. And we get so blinded spiritually and we get so enveloped in the things of this world that we lose sight of this one thing I do. This one thing I do. This is the core of everything that stems out of who I am. It stems out so that I can walk in this life that Christ says that I can walk. It's a walk of victory. I want you to know that every single person in Hebrews chapter 11, the, the faith chapter I call that, every single one that walked to their martyrdom, walked with their heads high, 
For they knew who they believed in and, and were persuaded that he was able to keep that which they committed until that day. Stephen, when he was being stoned, it says his face began to shine. There's a martyrdom grace that God gives to those who are being martyred. And think about it for one moment. What an honor for Stephen to give up his life for the gospel. For Jesus Christ. And yet the Bible says that when they were stoning him, he didn't say, Lord, get them. Kill these enemies of yours. He said, forgive them. Forgive them. And when he was just about ready to die, the Bible says Jesus stood up. What an honor to have the Lord and Savior seated at the right hand of God to stand up to welcome Stephen home. This one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind. That's your past. You can never change your future if your past is still your present. Hear me now. You can never change your future if your present is still the past. In order to change your future into the direction God wants it to go, you've got to forget those things which are behind because you and I cannot change a single thing that has happened in the past. The only thing that you and I have in our control is the present. And the present, when we make those changes, will change our future. Albert Einstein said th these words, he says, to do the same thing over and over again expecting a different result is insanity. You can't keep doing the same thing expecting a different result. In the financial realm, I can't keep pouring money into a marketing account or whatever and knowing that that account's bad and expect a different result. What I have to do is come up with a new plan. And when I make another plan and I make another investment and it's been proven, that's going to change. But you and I cannot change unless we're willing to forget those things which are behind. Yeah, but pastor, you don't know what I did. You don't know who I was. You don't. God does. Another reason why we don't forget those things or who we were before is because we're not living a crucified life. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. That you may walk in newness of life. Not walking around with a dead body on you of the old person. The other day the enemy came to me and tempted me with something. And I spoke right back to him and I said... You're tempting a dead person. That person that used to do that, it's dead. It's no longer I that live in that area. But Christ lives in me now. And I don't need to do those things anymore. That's going to change your future. We sing the song to be more like Jesus, but that's the only road that you can become more like him. Is if you're willing to live a crucified life. And if you're willing to, to forget those things which are behind. And reaching forth unto those things which are before. The reason why so many get, give up in Christian circles today. Is because they got their eyes on the reward that's here. Every martyr that dies for Jesus doesn't have their mind set here. They've got their mind set on the promises of God.
We sing that song, we are, we are all going to wear a crown. That crown is just not given. It's earned. For what you do down here is but a rehearsal. What you see down here is temporal. But what's up there is eternal. Hallelujah. If we keep our eyes on the goal, if we keep our eyes on the prize, no matter what sport it is, there's always a prize. There's always a goal. And the people that are trying to obtain that prize, whether it be a marathon, don't just wake up one day and decide to run the marathon to win that prize. Because I can guarantee you what will happen on a 26-mile run like the Boston Marathon. Within mile three, you'll be huffing and puffing and be dragging and falling on the ground. Why? Because your stamina has not been raised to that level of competition. You have not trained at that level to run that race. And what Paul is saying here is that if you want to apprehend that which you need to apprehend, it's going to come through training. It's not going to just come and drop in your lap. You've got to make the, the choices. You've got to be disciplined. You've got to apply the word. You've got to apply the cross in your life every day. You've got to choose to die to self. You've got to choose to let God work in you. And you've got to take that and exercise that. How many have ever started to exercise? You probably have exercised for a long time. And you started to exercise. How did you feel the next day? Oh, 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 my arms, oh, my legs. Why? Because those muscles were not trained to do what you did. You exerted something. But after a while, what happens? They begin to stretch and they begin to conform to what you're exercising. And you begin to build up what's called stamina. And as you build up that stamina, you can do more. And so the goals that you want to reach are, re are reachable because you have started to do something. But if you just sit there and expect it to happen, guaranteed, I'll tell you this, you can write it down. It's not going to happen. If you want a different outlook in life, you cannot keep doing the same thing you're doing. You've got to change. Oh, New Englanders hate change. We get in our little ruts, get in our little routines, and we don't change for nothing. But there's a power greater than ours that's asking us, if you want what's in this word, it's going to take effort. It's going to take change. It's going to make you uncomfortable. It's going to shake your comfort zone. It's going to call you out at times when it's the most inconvenient. I was on my way to do something the other day, and I got a phone call from the captain of the police department. He said, Chap, can you... Are you busy? I said, what's up? He said, we just had a suicide. 18 years old. Can you come? Now, I was on my way doing something. And I could have just said, well, you know, I'm on my way. I'm doing something. But there was a greater need than what I needed to do. So I put that aside. And I went. It's a sad situation. 
Then the next day, I got another call. An elderly lady had had fallen and she died. And I had to go there. I had already made plans to do something else. I was home. But these are things that you have to do sometimes in the most inconvenient time. Forgetting those things which are behind, because those things that have happened to you and I in the past will haunt us. It will stifle us. It will hinder us. Especially if we hold on to unforgiveness, if we hold on to any bitterness. Come on. It's going to hinder us. We won't be able to apprehend. That's why we have to forget those things which are behind and reach forth for those things that are before us. Verse 14. He says, I press toward the mark. When you press something, it's with effort. It's with, it's with strength. You're pressing something. He says, I press toward the mark. What's the mark? It's the prize. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What's the high calling of God in Christ Jesus? A pastor? No. An apostle? No. What's the high calling of God in Christ Jesus? Isn't it to be conformed into the image of his son? That's the high calling. My wife one time said to me, I I really don't feel like I do anything for Jesus. And she said this to me, she says, when I die, what will they put on my tombstone? On my gravestone? I said, you know what I'm going to put? She said, what? Linda Langevin, follower of Jesus Christ. There's no greater calling No greater accolade that a person could ever have than to be known as a follower of Jesus Christ. Not a religion, but a follower of a man who came to this earth. God in human flesh died upon the cross to save you and I. And to be known as a follower of Jesus Christ is the high calling of God because we have been conformed into his image. As the Bible says, you've been predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. God has already settled it. That's what he wants from you and I. But how we do that is to be able to forget those things which are behind and press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. It's a matter of your willpower. It's a matter of you surrendering your willpower. It's not by your willpower, but it's in surrendering your willpower to get that prize. There's only one person that will win the Boston Marathon. There's only one person that will win the New York Marathon. There's only one person who will win the NBA championship. There's only one team. There'll be only one team to win the Super Bowl. There'll be only one team to win the World Series, not two teams. And he says, I'm running the race so that I can win that prize. I'm going to do everything that I can to make it so that I will win it. And that's the consistency and the persistency that you and I as believers need to have in our hearts and in our minds. To be a successful 
pleaser of God. To please God. We cannot please God if we don't have faith. We cannot please God if we're always in the world. We cannot please God if we're with the ideologies and philosophies of the world. We can't please God. That's why we have to have our minds renewed. That's why we have to think differently than the world. We have to do things differently than the world. That's why we say things differently than the world. And they look at us as oddballs, but we're not the oddball. They are. Because Adam dropped the ball. Eve dropped the ball. And they thought they were doing good when actually they weren't doing good. But God tells us if we will have the mind of Christ, if we will put on the mind of Christ, like it says, if we start thinking the way that he thinks, start doing the things that he says to do, staying away from those things that he says stay away from, because he loves us and he wants to protect us, and he knows better. He knows all things. He says, I press toward that mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Is your life hidden in, God, in Christ? Is your ambitions hidden in Christ? Sometimes God will take you out of the world and the occupation of the world and put you in his service. He'll say, I don't want you doing that thing no more. I don't want you in the world no more. I want you to serve me and live by faith. Oh, that's tough. You've got to change your thinking. You've got to change your goals. But I can tell you this. I can tell you this from experience. When you surrender your jobs or whatever you do for Christ, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed out begging for bread. God has always provided for Linda and I. Always. Because we tithe and we give and we're givers. It, I just was amazed. I said, Lord, thank you for blessing us the way that you have blessed us. In my wildest dream, I could never, ever, ever think of how he has blessed us. I said, Lord... I would like to do less and less of constable work. But how would I make up the difference? Financially. And I don't do a lot of constable work, but when I do, it's, it's, it's decent. I get a phone call the other day from the captain from the police department. He says, uh, chap, he says, uh, how much do you make at the fire station when you go out on a call? I says, right now I think it's like 19.38 an hour, whatever it is. He says, okay, he says, because uh, the last year and a half with the police department, I haven't been getting paid for all the times I go out. He says, we're going to put you on payroll per diem. He provides. I didn't ask. I didn't push. He knows what you have need of even before you ask. That's what I love about God. He's already ahead of us. He already knows what to do. He already knows what to do. Verse 15. He says, let us therefore, as many as be mature or perfect, be thus minded. In other words, he wants you to think the way he has just previously had spoken to you. So many times when you hear a preacher preaching, you say, oh, you know, that's just a pastor. Or if we have a guest speaker, oh, that's just the pastor. No. The Bible says when they spoke the word of God, they, they took it as God was speaking directly to them. There was a respect for this pulpit. There was a, a respect to the person that stood behind this desk, sharing out of the God's word, sharing out of God's word, honoring what was being said. That it's not a, a man's word, but it's God speaking. The, the word is being spoken. These kind of, this kind of preaching you don't hear too much today. Expositional preaching from the text. All you hear is good stories and stories about this one and that one and, you know, this old lady and this one there. And they're good to have once in a while, but not as a sermon. You need the Word of God. This is what's going to keep you in tough times. Doctrine is what's going to keep you straight. It's a lost art today. 
I remember years ago, was talking with a bunch of brothers, and this, this brother was a teacher in the church. And we were talking about things, and he says, oh, we don't need doctrine. He said, we don't need doctrine. I said, excuse me? He said, we don't need doctrine. I said, that's not what the Bible says. The word doctrine means teaching. You're telling me we don't need teaching? We don't need systematic teaching of God's word to build us up? What, well, then what are you preaching? What are you teaching? If there's no teaching, what are you doing? And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. In other words, if you think differently than that, God's going to show you. You can only accomplish certain things by doing God's way. Amen? Next verse, please. He says, nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, in other words, whatever we have, whatever progress we have made already, wherever we've come by applying these principles that I'm talking about today, whatever you have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Don't walk out of here saying, oh, I don't have to do that. Don't walk out of here indifferent to what you're hearing this morning. Have the same mind. Have the same thing. Read it in God's word for yourself. What is the ultimate goal of the Christian? To be rich and prosperous? To be total health and wealth? No. No. There are great men of God that died of sicknesses. Did you know that? Elisha died of the sickness and he was sick. He was a prophet of God, called of God. Timothy had a stomach problem. Paul had eyesight problem. In this life you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. He has overcome the world. And there are times when we pray that God does healing, and there's times when we pray and God doesn't healing for whatever purpose that he understands and knows the alpha and the omega of every situation. I want you to take that this morning. He is the alpha and omega, the beginning of the end of every situation. He knows everything. But sometimes we, we sense like, God, aren't you hearing my prayer? Don't, yes, he's hearing your prayer. But I've come to the strong conclusion that God is not at our beck and call. He's God all by himself. And it's up to me to line up to his will. Last couple of years, I haven't told any, I don't think I've told too many people this. I have a ringing in my ear constantly, rings. It's loud. You too? Ooh, from working in a factory. Ooh. And every day I wake up and I ask God to heal this ringing in my ear. Sometimes it's really loud. It's still there. But I say, Lord, you said I'm healed in your word. I still hear the sound, but I'm believing that I'm healed. Now, that's not a denial. I just said, I can hear the sound. I'm not saying, nope, I don't hear the sound in Jesus' name. No, nope, no, I don't say that. No, I hear the sound. But I still believe I'm healed. I don't know when it's going to happen or how it's going to happen, but I believe it's going to happen. And it's been months. Months and months. It's still ringing. I can hear it now. And just when I think that I can't go anymore, I say, this is driving me crazy. That thought comes in my mind. I say, no, it's not driving me crazy. I say, God, your word says your grace is sufficient. Paul had a thorn in the flesh. He said, Lord, this Ringing in my ear is not even close to what you suffered for me. 
Let us walk the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Verse 17. I won't be too much longer. He said, brethren, believers at Philippi, both men and women were part of the church in Philippi. Be followers together of me, he said. Now that does not mean that you blindly follow a leader. Because we're human. You don't blindly follow a man. But you follow the ones who are following Christ. And you see Christ in them. And you see the Lord Jesus Christ in their walk. And you follow the example of what they've done. Today we have a word we call it emulate. In the, in the business sector, what you do is, if you start a business, whatever that business may be, you find someone who's doing that business. You get in touch with them, and you make friendship with them, and you ask them to teach you. Now listen to very carefully now. Not how to be successful. You ask them to teach you the things that they did wrong so you don't make the same mistake. And then you emulate the choices that they did make to change it. And that's how you become successful. Be followers together of me. If you see our life successful, Follow in that direction. I had given financial advice to someone in our church. I won't mention who they are. But their credit was terrible. All because of misuse of credit. And I told him, I said, this is what you need to do. Follow these steps. And when you follow these steps, God will restore everything. To you. Was it hot? Yes. Were the interest rates out of out in the sky somewhere? Yes. But they had to reestablish. And when they had to reestablish, it was at a high percentage. And they said, Wow, this is such high percentage. I said, Yes, but that's the cost. And today. They're proud owners of a new home, not a new home, but a home, new to them. And their credit is better. You know why? Because they changed their behavior and how they looked at things. See, there was a change. They didn't just keep doing what they were doing. They stopped doing what they were doing, made the necessary changes, and guess what? They got a different result. Follow people who are successful as Christians. Don't get with a Christian that's complaining about everything, talking about everything, grumbling and complaining about everything, because you will become like that. He said, let your speech always be seasoned with salt. Now, we fail at that. Sometimes we have a little pepper in our speech. Sometimes we have some hot peppers. <laughs> Sometimes some ghost peppers. But we should always know that the best interest of a person should be greater than yours. You should always want the best for somebody else even greater than yourself. I remember, I got a few minutes yet. I remember a little boy in Brother Norman's church. When I was playing the piano one day on Morning Manor, this little boy came up to me. He could just about see over the keys on the, on the, on the, because we were on the platform, and he came up to the piano. He could just about see over the keys. And with these big eyes, he said to me, 
I wish I could play the piano. And I said, you really want to play the piano? He said, yes. I said, do you really want to play the piano? He said, yes. I said, can I pray for you? He said, yes. So I laid my hands on his head. And I said, Lord, make him a better musician than I am. Give him a greater anointing than you put on me. Let him far exceed me in the music ability of playing the, the instrument. That boy is Ray Zimbalin. You ought to hear this guy play. He can play every key, every note, upside down, sideways, backwards. Every, I'm, I'm telling you, he's incredible. God answered my prayer. Am I jealous? No. Because I want the best, greater than what I have for you all. Rather than follow us together, me and mock them which walk so as you have us for an example. Find a Christian that you see walk in the walk and emulate them. Next verse, please. I'm running out of time. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. There are those in the church, they are enemies to the cross because they refuse to be conformed to the image of Christ. They refuse to keep the mark of the high calling. They, they refuse to attain what God wants them to attain. And so they stay remembering those things which are behind. They don't forget those things which are behind. And all they can do is crab and moan and complain and grumble. And we know what happened to the Israelites when they were in the wilderness for 40 years. What happened? They wandered around in circles. It wasn't that far of a journey. 60-something miles. 40 years stuck Keep flapping. And when you're in a wilderness, nothing grows. Everything's dry. Everything's dead. They become enemies to the cross of Christ. Hindrances. Blockages. Verse 19, whose end is prosperous. Is that what it says? No. Whose end is destruction. Whose God is their belly. Now, don't go around rebuking people that have big bellies. It's not what it's talking about. It's talking about their appetites. They serve their appetites more than they serve God. Of what they like to do. It's like you make the plan and you go to God, bless my plan. Rather than going to God for the plan and it will be blessed. We have it backwards. Oh, it's your seed time now. It's your harvest time now. Well, did you plant? Well, I'm expecting a harvest, Brother Joe. I'm, I got a big cornfield out there. I'm going to expect my harvest because I'm a seed time and harvest. Did you plant anything? Well, no. Well, you know what you're going to have at the end of the season? An empty field. Because you've got to plant something. And I'm not talking about money, please. I'm not talking about these heisters. Shysters, rather on television. Plant a seed. I'm not talking about that. But the seed, the seed principle is a biblical principle. What you sow, you reap. What do you sow? You've got to sow a seed. Sow obedience, you reap obedience. Sow godliness, you reap godliness. Sow right decisions, you get right answers. 
whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. The Bible says if you mind earthly things, you're no good to God. Those that have a mind toward the world are enmity, the Bible says. They're enemies of God. Why? Because the world's corrupt. The system's corrupt. It's from a fallen nature. It's not from what he expects from us to apprehend that which we need to apprehend. And that's to live for Christ and to die as gain as a Christian. Everybody comes here for the American dream. I call it the American nightmare. If you really want the American dream, surrender to Jesus your whole life then it doesn't just become an American dream, it becomes a whole worldwide dream. Amen. Who mind earthly things, verse 20. I'm almost done. Two more verses. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you put that up in the Holman version, the HCSB, I believe it's called? But our citizenship is in heaven. Do you realize that this is not our home? Where we live, our apartment, our homes, whatever we have. This ain't our home. And when you die, and when I die, you can't take it with you. You're going to leave everything behind. Those people that passed away the other day, they left everything behind, whatever they had. They're not taking it with them. We're citizens of heaven. We're only passing through down here. You're going to leave it all behind to somebody. from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you have that eagerness, that longing for Christ to come back? Not, please understand. Brother Diamond and I, we have conversations, and sometimes we butt heads. And he says, oh, some Christians, all they want to do is take, get the rapture to get away from all their problems and their bills. It's true. But that's not why we want the rapture, so I can get out of all my bills. You made them. Come on. Not that credit's wrong. I'm not saying it is. But watch what you do. Don't go overspending what you can't afford. That's what I love about Debbie. She doesn't go into debt. The Bible says, "Old man, no, old man, not oh, oh, to old man, nothing." That doesn't mean you can't have a mortgage, because it's in the Bible. It talks about lending money, but it's the abuse of it. And if you're abusing it, it's because there's a root problem of covetousness. Hello? That's why you don't need to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on a credit card and then expect all the credit card people to bail you out. You spent the money. You made the contract. You signed your name. And then what happens is you say, yeah, but we just call bankrupt and everything. Yeah, but you know who pays for that? All the consumers because now the interest rates go up to cover that bill. Hello? We have a citizenship which is in heaven. Lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, not on earth, where moth and rust corrupts, Jesus said. Lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. How are you going to do that? What treasures can you lay up in heaven? Souls. Win some souls. Go talk about Jesus. Lead some people to the Lord. I mean, genuinely, I hear all these stories. Oh, this guy led 12 people to the Lord. I say, yeah, right. Just because somebody says a, a, a two-minute prayer doesn't make them saved. Tell them why they need to be saved. Oh, sister, oh, if you come to Jesus, 
If you get saved, he's going to give you a new car, a home. He's going to bless you. He's going to give you all the things that you have need of. Wow, he's going to make you healthy. He's going to do all that kind of stuff because he loves you. Who wouldn't come to Jesus? But then when things don't work out, they're the first ones to backslide. Because the seed wasn't on the good ground. But if you have somebody come and tell you, listen, I want to tell you you're a sinner and you've sinned against the God and you've, you've angered God and you, you've got God's wrath in motion towards you and unless you repent of your sin, you will die and you will go to heaven if you, if you die without Christ. I'm here to tell you today that Jesus Christ loves you enough, God loved you enough that he supplied his son from heaven to come down to the stinking earth and to be whipped and beaten and mocked and ridiculed and put on that cross naked and go before all the people and, and people that were there and, and, he, and, and that shame of being naked on a cross, he did that for you. And when you come to Jesus Christ, it's going to, oh, it's free. Salvation is free, but it's going to cost you everything. It's going to cost you everything. You're going to have to give up your life. You're going to have to die to self. What kind of Christianity are you here today? Oh, God loves you. Just come to Jesus. He loves you. Just get saved. No accountability, no responsibility. Then they wonder why they're not growing because the seed's not on the good ground. I believe it. The Bible says the commandments of the Lord are pure and righteous altogether. The law converting the soul. Tell people about the law of God. Next verse. I'm, I'm, I'm going to finish that promise. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body. You got a transformation coming. Glory to God. Hallelujah. That only God can do it. That's part of the apprehension also. Just think no more tears, no more pain, no more heartache. No more loneliness, no more depression, no more anxiety. Come on, somebody. He's going to transform your body. I, I had one lady ask me one time, does that mean that I'm going to be skinny? I said, I don't know about that. I think God's going to take us just the way we are. By the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. By the power that enables him. The ability. Why does Jesus have that power? Because his father gave it to him. Remember Jesus said all power is given to me. In heaven and on earth. Verse 22. Oh, I'm sorry, that's it. Verse 21. So then in this way, my dearly beloved brothers and sisters, my joy and, my, and crown stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. We're going to receive a crown if we stay faithful. Keep your eyes on the prize. Amen. Keep your eyes on the prize. For this one thing I do. This one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind. And press on. The re how you can forget. I heard, I heard people say this. Oh, I forgive, but I'll never forget. No. You know, there's things I've done in the world. And then all of a sudden, I don't know, I'll see something, I'll be in a situation. I don't know if this has ever happened to you. And then something comes back to your mind, and you remember when you did that? And you go, 
Wow, I forgot all about that. Wow, I forgot all about that. Why? Because you're dead. That part died. That part no longer exists. I don't think of my mom being dead every single day. Does that mean I don't love her? No. But she's gone. And if I look at a picture or something, then, the, you know, the memory comes back. But other than that, I don't go every single day thinking about my mom, my dad, my brother. Why? Because they're dead. And it doesn't mean I don't love them. It doesn't mean you don't love me, though. But in the same way, when you die in Christ, old things are passed away. All things become new. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, new creature. The Bible says in Corinthians, all things are passing away. All things become new. Can't become new unless there's the passing away. That's why when the devil comes to you and tempts you in an area of your life, just tell him that Joe is dead. That Nelson is dead. That Rebecca is dead. She doesn't do that anymore. Well, the enemy comes and challenges you and says, why don't you just curse? When I was in the world, I cursed every day. So did you. Don't lie. Especially being in the police department and the fire department. And I go among them, go among them circles. Woo, those guys can use some words. You know what the Lord told me? He said, son, don't let them act any different. You're in their element. I've placed you in their element. Now, I'm not telling you to go and get a recording of swears and listen to it. Don't do that. <laughs> but I'm in that environment. And the Lord spoke to me and said this. It's not that which comes outside of a man that defiles the man. It's that's what's inside. And if that is not inside of me, it ain't going to defile me. That doesn't mean I go hang around it every day. But when I put myself in that element, and sometimes... When I'm in their presence, and something will happen, and I mean, they, 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 they can say some things. And something will come out of their mouth, even detectives. And they'll see me there and they'll go, sorry, sorry, chap. I said, listen, I appreciate that. You're respecting me that way. But don't change for me. But you change because there's one greater than me that is watching you. Hello? So what are we going to do today? What's our lesson for today? Forget those... Oh, you can't press on unless you forget those things which are behind. God gives each and every one of us a brand new day. And what you do with that day depends not upon God, upon you. Because when you get on your knees in the morning, you say, God, this is the day that you have made... I will rejoice and be glad. What is it you want me to do today? He says, what I want you to do is what you do every day. Get up and go to work and support your family. And you know, walking in the presence of the Lord and walking in the, in the will of God is a joy. Sometimes it's not, it's not convenient, but it's still a joy. Because you know you're where you're supposed to be. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you that you've called us to apprehend that which we need to apprehend. The prize, the calling of the Most High. Help us to be transformed 
into your image. Help us, Lord, to walk out this life. It's a real life. It's a joyous life. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, then joy, then peace. But we can't have peace if we don't have joy, and we can't have joy without love, that agape love, unconditional love, one for another. And Lord, sometimes we're guilty of not showing those fruits of your Spirit. But help us to be better at dying to self and our opinion and our ways to please you, to be more like Jesus, to say the hard things that need to be said in love. Thank you for this, your word today. Challenge us, Lord, as we go our separate ways. Help us to keep our eye on the prize, not look to the left or to the right, not to be distracted. I thank you for each and every one here, Lord. Bless them, surround them with your holy angels and protect them as they travel, Father. And I'll give you all the praise and all the honor and glory. Lord, you know those who are not here that should be here. We pray for them today. Lord, help them in their distress. We bind the devil and his powers in the name of Jesus and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God in their life. Those that are too weak for themselves, like the man on the bed that took, his friends took and lowered him through the roof. He was too weak, but they had faith for him.